In question one, it was asked to derive the net rainfall hydrograph for the storm given, considering the base flow to be constant. Let's first focus on that. I have prepared an Excel file where we have the given information and data for this assignment. First we have the area in squared kilometers. We have the precipitation given in millimeters for a certain time period. We have the discharge given at different moments. The discharge expressed in cubic meters per second. We should look out during this exercise that we keep mind of all of the different units that are used. Precipitation is in this case given in millimeters, discharge in cubic meters per second, but sometimes it's necessary to go to different units to be able to make the calculations. Always keep that in mind when doing the calculations. Now, for the base flow, we know that the base flow is the part of the hydrograph that would appear when there was no storm. At time zero in this exercise, we did not have any precipitation so far, because the precipitation starts just at the time zero for this first block until 30 minutes where you have 3.3 millimeters. But that actually means that at that time zero, all the discharge is actually base flow. So let's take that. We write down base flow, of course also the unit, cubic meters per second. And we know that at time zero, the base flow is 6 cubic meters per second. But as we consider a constant base flow for this first question, we actually can say that during the whole period that we are studying here, the base flow will be equal to 6 cubic meters per second. So let's drag that to the end, and then we have our base flow. Furthermore, we know that the storm runoff is actually the difference between the discharge and the base flow. Because the storm runoff is the remaining part when you would subtract it. So here we can also write storm runoff cubic meters per second. And we can make the difference between E2 and F2, which will be zero. Logically, at the start of the storm, we did not have any storm runoff. Now we can do this for all of the time steps, and then we get our storm runoff, like this. Now, in the first part A of question one, it was asked to use the runoff coefficient to uh, calculate the net rainfall hydrograph. Let's go back to our theory on the runoff coefficient. And there we see that actually the net rainfall is a product of the runoff coefficient with the actual rainfall or the rainfall rate if you want. We also know that the runoff coefficient can be calculated by taking the ratio of the total storm runoff Q and the actual rainfall volume I. So the first thing we need to do here is to calculate the total volume of storm runoff and the total volume of precipitation. The total volume of precipitation could be expressed in millimeters, but 
to go to an equal uh, unit, let's go to cubic meters. If we want to um, transform the precipitation from millimeters to cubic meters, we need to take into account the area of the catchment. The area is expressed here in squared kilometers. Let's express that one in squared meters. To go from squared kilometers to squared meters, we actually need to multiply this value with 1000 and again 1000. Yeah, because when you go from kilo, a kilometer to meter, you have multiplication with 1000, but it's a square, you need two times 1000. So that will be your value of the area in squared meter. The precipitation, if we want to express that in cubic meters, let's do that. Like that, that's our header. We need to take into account that we first go from the value in millimeters to a value in meter which will be uh, requiring a division by 1000 and then we need to multiply it with the area of the catchment that's B2 in this case and don't forget that we need to keep B2 fixed so no that's wrong wrong button like this like this and we drag and there we have the precipitation volume for the whole catchment yeah, for that uh, period okay like that let's make this a little bit more nice and based on this we can sum this up look out this is a Dutch version of uh, Excel normally you would write sum but in this case it will be sum like this and we sum up all of this like that and this will be I in cubic meters yeah, like this All right. So in that way, we have the first part that we require to calculate our runoff coefficient. Secondly, we also need the sum of the volume of the storm runoff. We have the storm runoff here expressed in cubic meters per second. And we cannot really sum up this because it's not a volume. To get to a volume, we need to take into account the time period. The time period here is half an hour. So to go from a cubic meters per second to a volume, we actually need to add, uh, multiply it with half an hour. Half an hour expressed in seconds will be, let's use that here. We're working in Excel, so that's easy. Let's say 30 minutes yeah, is actually, let's do it like this, 30 minutes. Yeah. If we would go to seconds, yeah, we need to say 30 multiplied by 60 to go from minutes to seconds. And that will be 1,800 seconds. So we need to multiply these values. Yeah with 1800 and that will be the volume that you would get on average during that time of 30 minutes so you could actually say storm runoff 
in cubic meters and then it is a volume and we could say we multiply this by our time and don't forget to fix that let's drag and we get our volumes as we did for the precipitation we can sum this up to get our total storm runoff expressed in cubic meters we sum up and we get our value let's make this a little bit cleaner we don't need all right so now we have our volume of storm runoff and we have our volume of precipitation so actually now we can calculate our runoff coefficient because c t let's write this here uh, here c t will be equal to the storm runoff volume divided by the actual precipitation volume and this is given by this value we don't need so many uh, numbers behind the decimal sign so our runoff coefficient in this case will be 0.258 if we want to calculate the net rainfall let's copy this one first we always expressed our uh, precipitation or rainfall as rates so let's do that here again then we have an additional exercise on uh, changing the units so we have precipitation in millimeters but we know that it takes half an hour so actually our rainfall rate let's put it like this expressed in millimeters per hour like this would be this value multiplied by 2 because actually you would multiply it by 60 minutes to have it during an hour but it's during half an hour so we multiply it by 2 then you get 6.6 .6 and just do the same for the others to calculate the net rainfall so I uh, n t in millimeters per hour let's make a subscript out of this one if that's possible not like this okay to calculate the net rainfall we use our formula multiply the actual rainfall rate with the runoff coefficient to get our net rainfall rate so we multiply this value with the value of our runoff coefficient fix that one like this we don't need so many numbers behind the decimal sign let's keep it with two and we drag to get our net rainfall rate like this so there you have your net rainfall based on the runoff coefficient with a constant base flow and based on this net rainfall and the actual rainfall we can now also calculate the losses that created this net rainfall so we write here losses 
also in millimeters per hour. And then we calculate the losses by subtracting the net rainfall from the actual rainfall. So we say E23 minus F23. And that's the loss for this first period. We drag to the end and we got all the losses during this storm. And just like in our presentation, we can also represent our hydrograph with the losses and the net rainfall. And we always take into account that we always represent the losses below the net rainfall. So that's something that we always agree on. So keep that in mind, keep the losses below the net rainfall. To do this, we select our time, we select the net rainfall, and we select the losses. We add a column graph, which would look like this. And here you see that still the losses are on top. Um, let's move this first. This and we call it graph 1.1a, okay, like this. Let's see, maybe if I change this, that changes already. And let's keep the colors that we had in our graph over here. So this one will become Take the orange one and this one will be the blue one like this so we have the losses here and the net rainfall and you see very well that there is a constant ratio between uh, the total or effective rainfall and the uh, net rainfall we still miss some uh, some representation of the axis here so let's add that to have a nice graph and add this this is time time in minutes and the y-axis we have precipitation in this case in millimeter per hour like that. and that's a nice graph okay that's actually what we had for part a of question one let's have a look at part b so we will do the same, but we will start using the phi index method. Now, if we recall from the theory, the phi index method or constant loss rate model is actually a, a method where there is always a fixed amount of losses. So we subtract a fixed amount from the actual rainfall to get our net rainfall. Now, the question will be to find this fixed amount that, are the, that should be the losses. And that's not that simple. Um, we could use a formula like this, but the problem is that we don't know which of the uh, peaks of the rainfall peaks that are actually contributing to the losses. Why? Well, very importantly, let's go quickly to the uh, next slide. We do know that um, if our losses would be larger than um, 
than our actual rainfall, we don't have any net rainfall. You can't have a negative net rainfall. Now, for example, for peak number four in this case, yeah, if you would subtract the five value from the actual rainfall in pulse number four, you would get a negative value of the net rainfall, but that is of course not possible. So in such case, or when it's just small, we have a net rainfall that is equal to zero. And because of that, we can already say that only the highest rainfall peaks will actually contribute to the net rainfall. And based on that, we take a calculation procedure. The first, st first step would be that you assume that only the highest peak will contribute to our net rainfall. So all the others will be lower than our five value because they are all cut off and you only have a contribution from the highest peak. You can calculate phi in that way. We will see a method for that in a second. And you can check now if this phi value that you get out of that is larger or smaller than the second highest peak. If it is smaller than the second highest peak, then your assumption from the first step here, where we assume that only the net rainfall contribute, is, uh, only the highest peak contributes to the net rainfall, is actually a wrong assumption. So we try it again, and then we assume that the two highest peaks will contribute. Again, we calculate the phi value, and if that phi value is smaller than the third highest peak, we have a wrong assumption. It might look confusing now at this time, but it isn't. I will show you uh, what the formulas are and how it is done in the exercise, and then it will be more clear. First, if we assume that only the highest rainfall peaks, one, two, or three contribute, what we do know based on our formula is that the sum of all the net rainfall peaks, yeah, in this case, that would be all of these, yeah, is actually the sum of the actual rainfall pulses, uh, but only the highest one, and that's why we write M minus m1 over here and not m like in this case minus the phi value because in all the other cases m1 peaks that do not contribute we get a value of zero but since this is a constant value we can take this this out of the summation and you get a representation like this based on this formula now so with the left hand side and the outer right hand side we can actually calculate the phi value because if we bring that out and we put those two together, you see that we get a representation for phi, an equation to find phi. The problem still remaining is that we don't know the net rainfall because that is what we are actually looking for. Now, the summation of the net rainfall we said at the start of this exercise and during the theoretical lecture that the sum of the net rainfall will be actually equal to the volume of the storm runoff. So that's what we're going to use here. If we go back to our Excel sheet, I prepared a 1.1b already, and you see all the information that was given before. Now, it could be maybe a little bit easier already to copy this. We don't need to redo that because we're still working. Let me uh, get rid of the curve, uh, the C value here. And we don't need to redo everything because we know already that these values are still the same. We're still working with a constant base flow. Yeah, this is still our constant base flow. Now, what we need is the sum of the highest peaks. Yeah, and like I said before, you first make the assumption that there is only one peak contributing, and then you go to the second, to the two highest peaks, the three highest peak, peaks, and so on and so forth. 
And here, this will be the sum of the storm length. Now, to be able to subtract those, we also need to take a care that we are working in the same units. So let's say that we um, transform our precipitation first to millimeters per hour. So let's call this then I T in millimeters per hour. And just like we did in the previous exercise, we say this multiplied by two, like that. Yes, let's move this. Now, we would also need our storm runoff now in millimeters per hour. So let's add another column over here. Yeah. This one. And let's write storm runoff in millimeters per hour. It's not always a good way to represent a, a sort of volume to sum up this, but in this case, we needed to calculate um, the value of phi. Now to go from storm runoff in cubic meters per second to storm runoff in millimeters per hour, that's a good exercise as well. We actually first need to transform cubic meters to millimeters and then seconds to hours taking into account as well that we only have 30 minutes. So, this one we say is equal to, and now let's first go uh, to take into account the area. So we divide by our area, yeah, then we are already at meters. But we're working in millimeters instead of meters, so we multiply by 1000. And then we're not working with seconds, we're working with hours. And our time period that we're looking at, we have steps of 30 minutes, so we multiply with 1800. And if we drag, that's a mistake. You see, that's why I always say that you need to fix these values. Yeah, so like that and like that. Otherwise you get a division by zero. And now you get the good values. All right. Now, let's assume that only our highest peak contributes to our net rainfall. That's our first assumption. So we'll say phi, yes, and also in millimeter per hour. In a first step, based on our formula over here, we only have one peak that contributes and the sum of the net rainfall. So we say the highest peak, that's this one, Highest peak minus the sum of all of this, and that would be our phi value in that case. But what we see is actually that it is 82.42 is lower than 96.8 and lower than 105.6. And this would mean that also these two peaks, smaller peaks than the highest one, would contribute to the net rainfall. And that was not our assumption. So this can be regarded as being wrong. So let's say that we um, cross this um, like this because it's wrong. Okay. The second try, second time, the assumption. Let's assume that we have the two highest peaks that contribute. So these two. Therefore, we sum up these two and we subtract the sum of 
or a storm. However, we now have two peaks that contribute, so we still need to divide this by two. If we look back to the formula here, yeah, we divide by the number of peaks that are taken into account. Let's make it a little bit more nice. Like this, okay. Now our value of phi would be 94.01, but still that is smaller than the 96.8 that we have over here. And this is then again saying that our assumption at the start is wrong, because this peak would also contribute to the net rainfall. So let's cross this again because it's wrong. And we start with the third iteration. Our third iteration, we will take into account three, the three highest peaks. So we say this one plus this one plus this one minus the sum of all of this. And don't forget, now we have three peaks that contributes, so we need to divide it by three. And now we get a value of 94.93, even 94 if we round it. And this 94.94 is actually larger than 46.2 and 13.2, or whatever other peak that might be there. So our assumption that only the three highest peaks contribute to the net rainfall is in this case valid. So we have found the phi value that we were looking for. Now, so let me do this quickly. Then it's a little bit cleaner. And here as well. Like that. Let's write down our time, like this, our actual rainfall, like this, and now we put in our phi value here, let's do it like this. Phi value is 94.94. Let's fix that. And then we create, we will calculate our net rainfall. Uh, N T in millimeters per hour. This. Let's try this one more time. If we can manage, yes, subscript. Yes, that's a little bit cleaner now. It's really the subscript now. Now we need to make a formula and we can make an if formula for that. Yeah, in Dutch it's called else. And we say if this one is larger than this one, then our value is zero. Otherwise, the value is the actual rainfall minus this one. So here you see that in fact that it's zero and here you have the values. Let's clean this up. That. Yes. So in that way we have created our net rainfall. We can now like in Part A, make a graph out of this one. Make a column graph. Yes. Let's move this. Call it graph 1.1. 1 .1. 
B, K. Let's. Oh, I made a mistake. You see already what the mistake is? I can, of course, not say that these are my losses, what I did now. So let's move this. No, let's keep it. Sorry. Let's say losses. We cannot represent phi as being the losses because the losses in the first step are not 94.94. The losses will be just 6.6. .6. You cannot have more losses than actual rainfall. So let's write losses and then we will do it like in the first exercise we say no, and it's equal to this minus this. So the actual rainfall minus the net rainfall. Let's drag, center this. Nice. So let's replace this one. Let's select the values, and instead of saying that it's phi, we say that it's the losses, and here also the values. Okay, that looks already better. Let's change the colors like we did in the previous one. This will be orange. This will be blue. And let's add some titles on the axis. This will be the time. This will be precipitation in millimeters per hour. So that gives us the two graphs that we were looking for. We have now calculated the net rainfall with a constant base flow based on the runoff coefficient. And we have calculated the net rainfall based on a constant base flow with the phi index or constant loss rate mod. If we look at the graph, as we mentioned during the lectures, the theoretical lectures, we see that the initial part of the constant loss rate model might be a better representation in this case because everything is lost, whereas for the runoff coefficient, we do have some runoff, some storm runoff from the first uh, peaks, although that they are very small. So this might be seen as, as more, rep more representative, a better representation of reality. However, the fact that it stays constant is not always that good. Here we see that there is always a contribution and it's always depending on how much rainfall there, in, there is in fact. And that is also, it's, it may be a better representation, but we have seen also during the theoretical lectures that an exponential uh, runoff coefficient would be a better representation. So just keep in mind that these global loss models, which are the, both of these, are actually um, yeah, approximations of reality and um, yeah, therefore we need to take care how to handle them, how to use them and uh, always keep that in mind. So that concludes actually our first question. In the second question we will be looking at the uh, same problem but with uh, a linearly increasing base flow instead of a constant base flow.